So it's a delight to be here. I thank Pat for the invitation and the, the hosting of the two fabled institutes uh, of this session um, and the day. So I, I'm going to switch tracks a little bit uh, and talk about some ideas I've had and, and I've been working on with my colleagues about how uh, impatiently we want information that we can only get from measuring the human brain to make the world better for people really soon. Okay? So I've said this super aggressively, uh, and then I'll retreat. All right? um, so uh, you know, I think we're all stunned by the fragile power of the human brain, the power to do the remarkable things it does. We're all stunned by that. That's what we study. That's what we're amazed by. It turns out to be a very tough problem to understand how the brain is so brilliant for language, for thought, for social interaction. Uh, but for every strength, it has a fragility. If it can learn to read, it can learn to be, be uh, can struggle with learning to read like a dyslexia. If it can have emotions, it can have depression or anxiety. It can have that thinking, it can have disordered thought like schizophrenia. If it can have a craving to socially interact, if you have social anxiety disorder, that very interaction is a source of fear and intimidation. So it's for, for every amazing power, there's a, there's a vulnerability. And on top of that, we know, um, and we've heard about this, this morning, that every infant is born into a neurobiological lottery. Uh, the genes they have, how they fit with the world we're in. For example, uh, if you had the genes to be uh, likely to be dyslexic, that would have been irrelevant 2,000 years ago. N almost nobody read, right? <laughs> so it's not just the genes that in, the, in, the, in some sense. It's the fit with the world that we live in and ha we have to navigate. Um, and it's a pretty severe lottery in many ways, as we understand over time. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of children, depending on your, uh, your threshold, are diagnosed with dyslexia. Uh, ADHD, about 8 percent. These are they're not, they're, there is some overlap, so it's not, you know, it doesn't add up to 100% of children having all problems, right? Um, autism, the latest numbers you heard are one out of 88, one out of 54 boys. Depression, bipolar disorder, estimated five, depending on the severity, five to 20% of children have a diagnosable difficulty these days. And for people who develop their difficulties in adulthood, you know, at least half of them are understood to have their roots in childhood experience and development. Um, and, and it's a very broadly stated now. But uh, the more we understand about these things, the more remarkable the healthy success of the brain has been. So um, up until a few years ago, neuropsychiatric disorders were j just really mysterious, frequently misunderstood. Uh, and one fantastic thing about functional brain imaging and other methods of brain imaging, it's made visible neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, they're, not, they're not the kind of lesions that Ralph showed you beautifully in the brain and the amygdala and so on, right? They're, they're invisible differences that really uh, uh, have a huge influences on people's lives. Uh, you know, here's a bunch of account from PubMed about the number of imaging studies per disorder. And here's an example down here just from our lab. And there's a lot of work out there that's beautiful and wonderful and, and, and informative, showing differences in brain activation while patients are just sitting there doing nothing or brain correlations between schizophrenia. Patients, uh, the individuals have a relative with schizophrenia. They don't have it themselves. It's the middle and the far end are control subjects. So it's made visible in many different ways, things like depression, anxiety, autism, in ways that are invisible by pure, uh, simple MR. That's the good news and the powerful news. And the, uh, um, the sort of mo thing that makes us modest is, as people prepare to make DSM-5, the book, the official list of psychiatric diagnoses, uh, that's happening right now, it's in the last stages, um, I'm going to say this as aggressively as possible, and then I'll, I'll retreat. Just uh, brain imaging has had no influence, none, zero, on the diagnostic categories in our field. Okay, is this fair? I'm going to get you. I'll take, no, Pat, are you lamenting it hasn't yet? Yeah, yeah. it's stunning. Um, and part of it's just the complexity of human minds and brains and disorders are way more deep. And you know, for those of us who thought the Human Genome Project would crack it open, it turns out to be pretty complicated at that level, too. Pe you know, human complexity is uh, just amazing. So, you know, where is, where are we rescuing everybody uh, uh, with, with these uh, difficulties in childhood or adulthood? And then, you know, uh, maybe not as much of an emergency in a sense to help people, but, um, you know, a place we would love to have knowledge about the brain is to somehow give at least some information for improving educational practices and policies. And uh, uh, you could say that's a, a more recent topic, and so we have a better excuse for saying uh, brain imaging and neuroscientists, I believe, and I'll say this aggressively, and I do, this is the field I work in, have had no practical influence uh, to improve education for children. All right. So, okay. So at this point, everybody's going like, "Well, thank you very much. Could you just leave?" You know. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm really interested in brain measures that can tell us about things that we don't know how to do yet. That feel to me like take us on the track towards helping people in the uh, finite future. 
dramatic things like cures for autism are not going to come from brain imaging work, although they might chip in in certain ways. Uh, that's going to come from breakthroughs in laboratories that we don't imagine yet in molecular neurobiology and genetics. It just can't come from, I think, from what we do. But uh, we can learn some things. I'm going to talk a little bit about reading and dyslexia, about social anxiety disorder, and about the ability to control uh, the rate at which humans learn uh, that might be relevant for some educational practices. And they share two things. They'll all be fMRI, and they'll all have this idea that we want to use brain measures to predict outcomes better than current educational, clinical, and medical values are available. Because if the brain signal is more informative, it could be practically helpful, and we have some new ideas to explore at a basic science level. So as you heard this morning, a be and beautiful, you know, the amazing mystery of studying uh, uh, language acquisition, how children learn to speak with caretakers, is that the babies are brilliant. We heard that this morning, right? So the entire job of, of the best researchers in the field, and you heard some this morning, is like, how do they do it? Okay, um, that's not the happen. You know what happens when you study reading, right? So what happens to a typical child? They're at home. They converse. Uh, they learn to converse with their caretaker, their mother, um, and the beautiful motherese we heard this morning, the fatherese, uh, and then they go to boot camp. Right? They go to that first grade or end of kindergarten, and the teacher's trying to get them to teach, and the parents really worried, and they're reading at home if it's a supportive environment, right? And uh, everybody's hoping that over several years of formal, difficult, explicit instruction, that child will read sufficiently that he or she can read textbooks, the internet, and do everything else in life uh, uh, that uh, education allows you to do. And so maybe it's not surprising that, uh, you know, somewhere in the order of 10 to 15 percent of children really struggle to learn how to read. And again, a, a problem that would not be relevant for anything until uh, relatively recently, and now it's very tough for kids in school. If you have a family member, you know this, uh, uh, because reading is everything in school. You know, everything, even, 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 on the, even when you're reading your text messages and not paying attention to the teacher, there's your text, right? <laughs> okay. so, um, and so we've been very interested, uh, uh, you've heard beautiful stuff about uh, Infant Meg here, about making fMRI uh, more, be you know, more pleasant for children and families. And we have uh, fantastic experiences, I'm sure you do here. Uh, here's a beautiful note we got from one child who participated in, in, in this experiment. <coughs> and she wrote, um, she, the, the scanner is noisy, she's a nine-year-old girl. Uh, uh, she says to the graduate student, you've had, I've had more fun in three days than I've had in any other place. Just think of it, I'm playing a game, she's doing a task, when at the same time I'm research guinea pig, one spelling error. <laughs> and who knows, I might help someone else my age if they have any brain problems while still earning money. And what do you think beats that? Nothing. I mean, it's beautiful, right? So, I, mean, so I think that's the coda for all of us who, who, who work on brain disorders. So, uh, so we looked at children about this age um, uh, doing a phonological task. So in one condition, they would decide in the middle, matching letters, whether two letters were identical, like P and P, or different, like D and M. That's a simple thing. You don't even have to know that they're letters. Or we asked whether the sound, the names of the letters rhyme. So G and K end in different sounds. T and D both end in that E sound. The very process of learning uh, to read essentially is mapping the sounds of language that you learn at home <coughs> to the mysterious uh, uh, s you know, black and white strokes on the page that are pregnant with sounds. Right? You have to figure out how do those things on the printed page go with the sounds of language that I know. So here we're taking, making a very simple example where children in, in the left in the rhyme letter condition have to ex think about how those uh, letters are pregnant with sounds. And what we found in the top row going uh, uh, in fMRI in uh, typical children is that in this experiment, they activate areas, so th those are slices uh, left is left and top is top, going three consecutive slices up in the brain, something near towards Broca's area, something towards Wernicke's area uh, in, the top, in the typical children. And you can see that children who struggled to read at this age failed to engage that posterior area at all. Uh, and the anterior one, the one up sorry, in the upper part of the picture, uh, is also looks different. All right, so may, again, what imaging does is it renders visible uh, this fundamental brain differences in how these children are, are attempting to extract sounds from letters. Um, so that's a description of correlation, something to think about. We'd like to actually get closer to doing something that we think is useful, and, and uh, this is the direction we went on this. So uh, we know that some children compensate. Some children who are very poor readers make substantial progress. They usually don't love reading. They're not the best readers, but they read well enough that all their other talents can be expressed pretty well. Some children really struggle. They're terrible readers, you know, as, five, as 10 year olds and as 15 year olds and as 20 year olds. They just don't seem to break through. So we wanted to understand what is the difference between a child who over time compensates reasonably well and a child who fails to make that progress? Um, and what's, how, how can we think about that? So in this study, we looked at 25 children with dyslexia. They were slightly older children, um, average age of about 12. 
typically 20 typically children, typically developing children. And it, it, what we did initially is do functional MRI, as they did a language task, I'll show you in a moment, diffusion sensor imaging to look at white matter, and 17 behavioral measures that are widely used by educators and researchers alike, of how you read single words, how you pronounce non-words non to look at the rules of language, IQ measures, 17 of the sort of most widely used and you know, we think high quality measures. And then we saw them two and a half years later, so two and a half years of life passed for these struggling leaders. Some of them got interventions, some of them didn't. Um, and then we just looked at how they were doing in their reading two and a half years later. Uh, and here's the task they did. These are older kids, so we had them looking at pairs of words and deciding if they rhymed or they didn't, and we made the endings be not, so it's not trivial. You have to know the, the light and bite, how they sound to make that rhyme judgment. Here's the uh, behavioral performance, the reading capacity of these individuals over two and a half years. So um, I guess I can walk over here. Uh, so this is single word reading. This is the average and this is the green line. These are the control subjects above average. The first time we test them and the second time, they're becoming better readers, but this is adjusted for age. They were you know, pretty good for their age and they were pretty good for their age. In blue are the children who are persistently dyslexic. They were struggled to read single words and they're still very bad two and a half years later. And these are children who broke through to some extent for reading single words, and they broke through even more impressively for comprehending paragraphs, which is the end point really of reading. It's not, it's not getting that word, it's getting the content of the paragraph. So these children, you know, they're not reading as well as they might, but they're really made a lot of progress, okay? So what's the difference between a child who breaks through and a child who doesn't? Can we tell from a brain imaging measure, time one, the fate of these children for reading ability two and a half years later? And the answer is, uh, you know, we got a correlation. So the red dots here are each individual child who's a poor reader. And the more they turn on this area in the right prefrontal cortex, the more the reading improved over the next two and a half years. And the, the right frontal cortex is a funny place to get it because um, uh, uh, as you become a better reader, you become more on the left. It becomes more specialized on the left on average and more posterior because we get more automatic at reading. Okay? So it, these children are going a completely different path than typical development, and they're better off, as far as we can measure from this one study, they're better off going a completely different way. And so this is a bit of a challenge when we think of remediation. We usually think we want to get people to do it like everybody else. Maybe these children, at least by this age, need to do it as differently as possible, okay? So it has I th some implications for that. Um, if we, um, uh, amazingly, none of the behavioral measures predicted who would get better. And at first I thought, well, that's just because we didn't do it right, we didn't read the right literature. Uh, we couldn't find any paper or any expert who said, I know a measure that will tell me in two and a half years how these kids will do. Um, uh, and if we did multi-voxel pattern analysis using some computer analyses to try to get individual predictions, and these are the voxels that mattered for that prediction, uh, we could, in this particular study, don't know how it will replicate yet, um, we got about 92% accuracy in predicting on a child-by-child -child basis who would be in the compensated group and who would be in the uh, struggling group, you know, for something that by current educational measures uh, is a chance. Let me tell you quickly about the social anxiety disorder, uh, uh, surprisingly common if, you, if you're not exposed to that, a uh, fear of uh, interacting socially with other people, surprisingly debilitating, for example, you know, you don't want to compare one disorder versus another, but it has twice the rate of unemployment versus anxiety and depression. That makes sense. If it's scary to go for an interview, if being in a workplace with other people is, is, is scary, I mean, literally fear-inducing, uh, that's tough to get, a, to get a job and sustain a job. Treatments are either a behavioral therapy or pharmacology. About half the patients benefit a lot. Depends what your criterion is. Uh, there's almost no evidence at all for which treatment a person would get. I was <coughs> amazed by this. I'm not a clinician. I work with a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist. I said, okay, how do you guys decide usually if a person should get medication or behavioral therapy. And they go, I don't know. You know the, one, of them, one of them was a psychopharmacologist. He said, I like drugs. <laughs> the other one is a CBT specialist. He says, I, I like CBT. Uh, uh, other people will say, it all depends on the health plan you have. Um, so uh, I, I, it's amazing, right? Wow. Uh, uh, you know, it's, not it's uh, shockingly close to this at the moment about how treatments are approached. Never mind amazing treatments we wish for, but currently available therapies that sometimes work. So we just asked for uh, 51 of these patients who went through uh, whether the brain measure could predict better than, uh, cur than the rating scale used in that research, the Leibowitz uh, Social Anxiety Scale, could predict better who would benefit after six weeks of intensive cognitive behavioral therapy. If we take your measure at time one, can we tell who's likely to benefit from that and who is not? Um, and we had them looking at uh, emotional faces compared to neutral faces. I'll focus on that. And basically, 
what we found in each gray dot here is an individual showing you how much they improve from beginning to end of the treatment. We could see a distribution in two areas in, in higher order visual areas uh, that predicted far in combination with the, the clinical description far higher. So it was 0.38 and it moves up to 0.71 and 0.68. And we can look at brain structure and we get a 0.52 correlation. So that's still way better than the currently available clinical rating scale. So, you know, uh, we're not quite, you know, where we want to be at on this at all towards the application, but could you imagine if you could walk into a doctor's office and they would know on a scientific basis which is an optimal treatment for you as opposed to randomly sending you to one or the other? Um, you know, same thing with uh, dyslexia. If you could tell a parent, sit back and relax. We have to worry what you tell the parent, you know, <laughs> where it doesn't look good. Uh, but certainly it tells us that maybe we should try radically different treatments for those who are not likely to, to, to benefit from treatment as usual. The idea that you could predict who would benefit from treatments is really exciting to me, I think, as a, as a practical, short-term application of neuroimaging to sort of help people. Um, we had some work showing that uh, some years ago showing that response to, uh, there's, a, there's a 20 papers out there from different investigators showing that our responses to emotional faces predicted uh, treatment, uh, depression six months later. Here's a st stunning study from UCSD saying that uh, measurement coming out of a treatment program for addictions predicted, you know, over 90% who would relapse in the next year, which is amazing compared to what things are now. Now, these studies are scattershot. You know, I'll talk about that, you know, or maybe I'll be putting the spot on there. So it's not like we're ready to go tomorrow, but we're really close, I think. I mean, this is not, you know, this is, fMRI is done now with patients as they're diagnosed now. This is not 20 years from now. Last thing I want to talk about, um, yeah, let me jump to that. Um, but basically, this idea is that, you know, with brain imaging, we can get incredibly better and understanding something deep about diversity among people. And that diversity uh, speaks to their future fate and, what, and how they can be helped. The last thing I want to talk about is um, a small, more narrow step towards thinking about issues for education. So imagine if as I sat here, I could tell right now who's about to remember what I'm about to tell you and who's not, <laughs> all right? Okay, imagine if I'm a teacher and I knew in this room and I'm going to tell you I'm very far away from doing this, okay? Uh, you know, is two-thirds of my class ready to grasp what I'm about to tell them? So that's the idea. Okay, here's the bait and switch. It's going to be a very narrow experiment in the scanner, okay? Uh, but here's it. So we looked at uh, memory for, for spatial locations, places. Um, and we know from a number of studies that if we present you a number of scenes like these and then test your memory on them a little bit later, uh, you'll remember some things and you'll forget other things, right? That's life, right? Um, and we know that if we look at your brain while you're seeing these, we get a correlation that the more these are turned on while you see these, the more likely you are to remember a particular scene. The more these areas are not turned on, the more likely you're to forget. The more that experience you're having now is doomed to being forgotten in a few moments. So, so this is kind of a fMRI picture, as far as fMRI can take us, of the formation of an enduring long-term memories or what's being set up to be forgotten as soon as we've seen it or heard it. So uh, in this experiment, what we did is, instead of seeing how you respond when the information arrives, you're just laying in a scanner, and we're going to ask, we're going to see naturally occurring fluctuations in your brain. You're just sitting there, we're going to look at your brain state. And the first we do a correlation in the usual way, and say, what, before the picture arrives, what brain state is conducive for being more likely to remember something before the information arrives? And we find that it's in the spot. And then the last experiment, last, uh, last two slides I'll show you is this. So now we have a person in the scanner, and we know we have these targets, and we know what we're looking for. And we use real-time functional MRI. As you know, as many of you know, <laughs> through daily struggles, uh, here's what we do. We do about 10 hours or 20 hours of fMRI uh, uh, recording, and then we do about 20 months of analysis because of the signal problem. <laughs> okay? And that's, th that's not like the beautiful talk you just heard. That's my modest lab doing this here. So, uh, so now what we do is we have you in the scanner, and we actually record real time, but it's, of course, it's delayed by six seconds at least because of the hemodynamic response, but in roughly real time, uh, brain activation in these regions. And then we use that activation to say, when is this brain area by the brain signal ready to learn, and when are you not ready to learn? Moment to moment to moment. We're tracking when is your brain ready to learn, and when is it not ready to learn? And as soon as we see a, a, a brain activation that looks like you're ready to learn, boom, we send something in. And when it seems like you're in a highly forgetting situation, boom, we send something in. Okay, so your brain state is controlling when information is presented. And of course, I wouldn't present this if it hadn't kind of worked out. Uh, you know, uh, if we send the information in when your brain state is ready to learn, and if we send the information when it's not ready to learn for this content. 
So the idea that we have a, the, we're very close to be able to measure when your brain is prepared to learn, and we could optimize learning and training in this way or promote this kind, you know, it's a at least we have the brain signal for that. Um, so I showed you these different attempts to get close to things that we think are moderately close to being really useful uh, in terms of uh, thinking about the future struggles that people have, what treatments are optimal. And in all these three examples, uh, the brain measures predicted things that we could not have come by current education. I could not sit here with anything and tell you, you know, you are about to remember the next thing or you're not about to remember. You know, we need the brain measure to do that. It doesn't have to be fMRI. It could be something else. I have wonderful collaborators, and thanks for your attention.